So, um, <clears throat> thanks for, to uh, MIT, obviously, for inviting me. Uh, great pleasure to be here with uh, friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and thanks for um, coming out and, you know, such nice numbers while the sun is uh, shining outside. Um, anyway, mm, I'll be... Uh, I'll be a little bit disorganized. Uh, I didn't have much time to prepare um, today's talk. In fact, uh, I only did so this morning. Um, and on, and on, the plane, on the plane over uh, yesterday, because um, I just so happened to have opened a, an exhibition I curated on Thursday in Antwerp, the Museum of Contemporary Art, where I work. Um, it's a survey show of art, from, uh, art by artists from Rio de Janeiro, uh, 26 in all. And... Um, Fifteen of them were actually present, which I hope will partly explain um, why I may appear exhausted at certain <laughs> times during the lecture. Uh, not just because of the artist, but also, and this is quite an interesting thing about Brazil, um, you know, also famous dead artists send their um, spawn to uh, various uh, venues to install their work. Um, you know, grandchildren, nephews, quite something. Um, and they, obviously, are also quite demanding, just socially. Um, I mean, that said, having, you know, having to have uh, had the experience of working with uh, Brazilian artists, I have to say, was, did serve as a really great presentation, or a re really great uh, preparation for today's, uh, uh, today's uh, presentation. Because one of the things that I've <clears throat> been, again, made to realize through this project, the show of, uh, of Brazilian art, is that Brazil, and this very much I, I, I feel in, in, in distinction to uh, the Europe that I'm from, that Brazil truly is a country of the present. Um, it's no longer a um, country of the future, a land of the future. As Stefan Zweig uh, uh, put it 70 um, years ago or so, Brazilian, ein Land der Zukunft. Um, Whenever I quote somebody, I always like to add a picture of the people in, in question. So Stefan Zweig here standing. Um, he's not very well known. In fact, the man immigrated to uh, Brazil in the early 40s and um, sadly not really um, well, not, well known enough uh, to the English-speaking world. And uh, perhaps interesting to add for the purposes of the current conference that he, um, like one of his most enjoyable um, writing projects was a, a book called The World of Yesterday, a very extended memoir about the Europe that he saw disappear. Um, anyway, so Brazil, no longer really just a, a country of, of the future, a land of the future, but really a land um, of the present. Um, a, a country whose contemporary culture is to a certain extent uh, characterized by a healthy disregard for history, even for its own past. Um, and in the exhibition that I curated, this translated, or this observation translated itself in the fact that none of the, exhibi none of, none of the works on, on display in that show required any knowledge on the part of the audience of any art historical reference. So in, in a... In a in, well, in a sense, I'm not going to claim that as a curatorial triumph because, of course, it's the triumph of the artists themselves. But um, for me, it, it really, revisiting that exhibition and revisiting the whole experience of putting it together, it, does, it, it, it was kind of um, quite refreshing to actually work on an exhibition that um, is so very, you know, the work in which is so, in, is so very rooted in, in, in the present. And, and, of course, the reason why this is the case probably has to do with the fact that, you know, Brazil is, con is, 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 uh, is experiencing something of an economic boom. I mean, not just something of an economic boom, like a huge economic boom, huge enough or big enough to have been put in the, upper, in the, in, in, in the position a couple of months ago to actually buy up Portuguese debt, which is, of course, you know, a kind of an interesting um, form of colonial revenge. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, of course, this being a, a country really um, awash in economic confidence, it will also be awash in, in cultural confidence. And, and it, I, for me, as a curator, it was very interesting, in fact, to have to, 
to, to be working with, with artists who really um, seem oblivious to, pa to the past, seem oblivious to history, or seem kind of historically blind almost, you know. And, um, and of course, you know, I, I'm obsessed by history myself, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, I think. Um, but it is, it is, of course, interesting to always kind of uh, look up the challenge in a way. Um, and I did find that. Um, now, Brazilians um, and Cariocas, the inhabitants of Rio de Janeiro, they of course have a notoriously promiscuous uh, relationship with time. Uh, they don't wear watches. And I've also noticed that they disable the uh, time-telling function on their mobile phones. Um, which, you know, in that sense, they do remind me a little bit of the uh, enraged proletarians who in the Paris of 1830 went around the city smashing the clocks that were, you know, there to discipline the natural cycles of time. And um, I mean, of course, not having to deal with a very different cultural conception of time and scheduling and or does present a lot of organizational difficulties, uh, which I've uh, had to experience, you know, like shipments um, not arriving, in fact. And, and, uh, um, um, but it does make for an, for an interesting artistic environment that, uh, as I said before, is still relatively free from a slightly tyrannic cult of um, historical referentiality, which I sometimes find to be mildly paralyzing in, lot, in a lot of kind of contem contemporary artistic practice in uh, the northern Atlantic, so to speak. Um, so, and the result, in a sense, uh, is to my mind an artistic culture in which the question of the use and abuse of history is still a relatively marginal one, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I, I didn't have, I don't really have a title for today's talk, but uh, what was it? <laughs> contemporary art and the uses of well, so my proposition would be contemporary art and the uses and abuses of history. And that's, of course, a uh, direct reference to Friedrich Nietzsche, here <clears throat> as depicted by, Friedrich, uh, by, by Edvard Munch, who um, early on in his career gave us vom, Nut vom Nutzen und Nachteil der Historie für das Leben, on the use and abuse of history for our life. Um, because that's really a little bit... Um, um, that's a kind of what, I'm, what, I, what I'd like to uh, reflect upon just very briefly today. And I think I may come across not just polemical, perhaps provocative, but so uh, be it. Um, because of um, what I've long been thinking about in the last couple of years um, has to do, in fact, with, uh, with something like... Um, Contempor the potential dangers, really, of contemporary art's occasionally excessive historical awareness. Uh, and I've written about this topic on a number of occasions. And, you know, one of the better-known articles in this regard is something that I published online in 2009 as a contribution to EFLUX Journal. Um, and this is a, um, an essay titled The Way of the Shovel on the archaeological, imaginary, and historiographic impulses in contemporary art. Um, and one of the things that I noted in this aforementioned essay is that what may initially start out as a very necessary and sensible engagement with history in the recent past through the excavation of car archival materials can okay, on occasion degenerate into a morbid obsession in which retrospection appears as the only optic available to serious art. And the danger of this nostalgic cult of the past is that it effectively undermines art participation in the very urgent business of trying to imagine a better present. Um, I'm not even going to mention the, the, uh, the idea of the possibility of, of participating in the attempt to imagine a better future. Um, and I'd like to, in this regard, turn immediately to Nietzsche um, and just you know, read, out, read out a couple of um, quotes from this publication, which dates back to the mid-1873, uh, there you go, yes. So just a couple of you know, quotes to get ourselves going. Um, here's the preface. We do need history, but quite differently from the jaded idlers in the garden of knowledge. We need it for life and action, not as a convenient way to avoid life and action or to excuse a selfish life and a cowardly or base action. 
We would serve history only so far as it serves life. But to value its study beyond a certain point mutilates and degrades life. Of course, the historical context of, uh, of, the, of the publication matters. This is, you know, 1873 is three years after, um, after Germany is, as, after the German Empire is, is, is uh, founded um, as a direct result almost of the, uh, of the Prussian victory over France and the Prussian uh, French War. And, you know, this is a time of Bismarck and, and, you know, a young nation that has to find its, you know, a kind of a narrative of legitimacy in historical moorings that are um, partly, that, that, that very quickly become fictionalized. And, and, um, and this is really the, um, the target of, of uh, Nietzsche's diatribe, you know, German, the uh, very young state's obsession with its historical roots with roots, so to speak. Um, in fact, so, uh, so displeased was Nietzsche with, with the German cult of its own past, partly fictional or not, um, that I think this is also pretty much the time that he took up the uh, professorship um, in, in Basel. He was uh, named a professor at the University of Basel at the uh, impossible age of 24. And um, I think this, uh, he became a stateless person, in fact, uh, around that time. And we've already encountered this, you know, the issue of statelessness in, in Matthew's presentation. Um, so in the preface, he then says that, you know, he believes that we are all suffering at, in 1873, but this could also be true of 2009 or 2011, that we are all suffering from a malignant historical fever and should at least recognize the fact. Maybe not so bad to suffer from the fever, but it may be bad to, act, to not recognize or acknowledge the fact that we you know, find ourselves in a slightly pathological situation. Um, yeah. This is the point that the reader is asked to consider that the unhistorical and the historical are equally necessary to the health of an individual, a community, and a system of culture. The unhistorical and the historical being forgetting and remembering. That a fine balance between forgetting and remembering has to be struck to, to guarantee... Um, well, he uses the word health, which of course is a problematic one, but, you know, the, the, um, the virtue of a culture. But maybe virtue is just as problematic. <clears throat> the value we put on the historical may be merely a Western prejudice. Dixit Nietzsche on page 11. And, and this, you know, could be refined today by, or paraphrased or, 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 or reformulated. The value we put on the historical may be merely a Northern Atlantic prejudice. And, you know, this is a little bit what I, why I talked about the, the, my, my experience curating a show of Brazilian art at the beginning, um, that I really felt that, you know, the the current um, fascination with um, historical research seem, can very quickly seem rather uh, provincial and parochial. <coughs> and here's a really great uh, description of the archivist leaning over his table. The horrid spectacle is seen of the mad collector raking all, over all the dust heaps of the past. He breathes a moldy air. The antiquarian habit may degrade a considerable talent, a real spiritual need in him, to a mere insatiable curiosity for everything old. He often sinks so low as to be satisfied with any food and greedily devour, devours all the scraps that fall from the bibliographical table. It's a pretty harsh one, but uh, didn't want to... Uh, be selective. <clears throat> and then the, let's see. Here's the last bit. Our modern culture is for that reason not a living one, because it cannot be understood without that opposition. In other words, it is not a real culture, but a kind of knowledge about culture, a complex of various thoughts and feelings about it from which no decision as to its direction can come. Um, and this, you know, this, this I, I found to be like a really kind of riveting insight. 
that um, it's not that we no longer that he feels he no longer inhabits a real culture, but he inhabits a complex of knowledge about culture, um, and in a sense, it remind it's it basically it's a bit of an echo, in fact, of um, of something that one of his great predecessors and his arch enemy said, uh, namely um, Hegel here pictured at the lectern when he prophesied the end of art. Um, you know, when um, I, along with his uh, colleague and later rival, um, Friedrich Schelling, I think uh, so they, they both share in their aesthetics and in their aesthetic uh, theory um, the intuition that um, when art has come to an end, that reflection upon it takes the place of art. That, you know, the blossoming of art theory always happens at art's expense, which is probably why I'm here. Um, and, um, and in a sense, yes, that's, um, and that I'm here is of course deeply problematic, I, you know, admit, I accept. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, to me, uh, I, I've long, it's, it's very complicated and, you know, it's very, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> Great title for a show, it's complicated. Um, because of course, you know, as I already said, and you know, here I am quoting 19th century moldy air breeding uh, German scholars and, and, you know, kind of denouncing the historiographical gaze as, as, you know, pathologically inclined. I, of course, myself suffer from the very pathology, from, from that very uh, pathology. So what can we do if we are aware? What, how can we enjoy our symptom? Um, well, I think that one thing that we could do is try to kind of figure out why exactly a certain symptom emerges and why all of a sudden a certain kind of cultural phenomenon appears to be so dominant. And, you know, dominant not so much in, uh, in, in, in crudely quantitative terms, but really qualitative terms, you know, and, 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 and the terms of quality that are basically guaranteed by the fact that the MIT, you know, MIT um, uh, the, the votes a conference to it, or that, uh, or that you know, October is still is still around and, and can publish special issues on obsolescence and, and like very kind of self-reflective, of course, uh, in that sense. Um, so why are we so why why this why this yes why this kind of constant why this ret retrospective glance in which I also participate. Um, there's a couple of reasons, and I'm just going to, you know, kind of um, try to define, well, try to kind of determine some, uh, uh, some of them. Um, of course, you know, the one, like the biggest, the biggest stimulant, I think, or the biggest motivation for this, for art's turn towards archives and towards historical research and historiographic, and, and historiographic uh, research has to do with the fact, of course, that, you know, live in a, in a world in which, um, the pressure to forget, you know, increases um, every day. You know, we live, we kind of live in a world that is built on a culture of um, forgetting, um, a culture in which acceleration and speed are um, are held up as the highest uh, virtues and, and, and or the highest uh, uh, types of technological achievement. You know, the entire the entire business of technological development is based on you know, the desirability of speeding things up. And, you know, the faster things go, the easier it is to forget them, of course. Um, and, and there's, you know, kind of a, politi uh, there's a political dimension to this thing that has to do, to, to this fact that has to do with the fall of the wall, 1989, the triumphalism of, uh, of you know, of, of uh, liberalism, um, um, the triumphalist mood of, 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 uh, of, of capitalism of the last 25 years the increasing demand to forget whatever went on before. Um, also, you know, the, the, the sheer fact of the outsourcing of our memory to machines, you know, the fact that um, uh, memory is now commonly associated with computers rather than with people. Um, and in many ways, it is quite clear that art, and this is where it of course appears in its, you know, almost purely therapeutic and missionary uh, guise, that, you know, art, always or very often uh, wants to come to the rescue of that which is under threat of disappearance or under threat of marginalization. Um, 
that which falls by the wayside of, 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 you know, of mainstream culture, really. Um, and here, in a way, is where art kind of comes into its own as, uh, as a memory disk of contemporary culture and as a history channel, a history channel, which is why I used the logo of History Channel as the introduction to my talk. It wasn't some facetious joke, as some may have supposed. Um, and <clears throat> so there's a crisis of history that I think the contemporary art world just plainly responds to in a very positive, in a very positive fashion. You know that art becomes a or that the art world is the place where things are remembered that elsewhere are under threat of being forgotten. Um, and I haven't really done any kind of research into this very subject matter, but it would be interesting to look at the, what I assume uh, would be a drop of attendance of history classes in, in schools around the world. You know, I think that you know, history as a core, as, as a core um, facet of, of universal education is, uh, has been on the wane for quite a while. Um, and I think that the crisis of history can also be, we can also kind of um, distinguish um, the, out, the, the, the contours of a crisis of, of history in the trivialization of history as an academic discipline through the overproduction of um, books that recount the history of the zipper or the history of the toilet bowl, or the history of the cod, or the salt, the history of oysters, the history of um, the pencil, the bower hat, these things all exist. I mean, I'm not making them up. Um, so, you know, the loss of panoramic vision on the one hand, but also, you know, just plainly the taboo on, on, on grand historicizing schemes. And we know why those taboos are enforced, and they were initially enforced as a very... Um, as a very um, legitimate ma as a, le a very legitimate um, operation, but um, you know at some point the loss of panor of you know not the survey but but the loss of like something akin to a grander ambition becomes problematic, and what we are left with is a um, yeah sometimes a slightly immobilizing and demoralizing cult of the fragment you know which is why I think. Walter Benjamin, for the last 20 years, has been the most important and influential thinker of, uh, in, 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 um, in this particular part of academia, because he's the, you know, he's the prophet of the fragment and the prophet of uh, fragmentation. Um, anyway, a second, that's only the first, and I have a 40 seconds. Uh, no, I have already crossed the 20-minute mark. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Matthew, I think you talked about art, um, the cousin, uh, reportage as the, as the cousin of history writing. And, and of course, I, you know, um, here is a little bit where, here's also the, 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 the point where art into, enters into the picture as, a, as, a, as an ennobled form of journalism or, or ennobled reportage. Um, the second factor in my diagnosis being or kind of centering upon the increased entwining of artistic practice and research or knowledge production. Um, which, you know, of course means, in, uh, in a sense, you know, the fact that, uh, um, you know, many artists today, and, and Jan just mentioned it himself, he doesn't have a studio. Um, um, many artists uh, today spend time in libraries, in archives, in, in, you know, in museums, of course, you know, which is, of course, also partly where, um, where the source or, or where, the, where the roots of, inst of institutional critique should be located. Um, the, you know, turning towards discursive, discursive uh, spaces rather than productive um, or, or the spaces of, of, of uh, a more, um, you know, direct type of um, material production. Um, the increased pressure as well of discursive literacy you know, the, the, uh, the inevitable academization of uh, uh, artistic practice through its inclusion in um, academic curricula of universities. Um, you know, the fact that art history or art departments in Northern America are part of universities is something that uh, for the longest time didn't make much, much sense in, in Europe where they were very long treated as islands off the coast of academic society. Um, <clears throat> I have to kind of rush 
through this perhaps, but uh, just you know, very quickly I'm going to um, um, figure out the, f the third and the fourth uh, um, factors in, in, my, in my diagnosis. And then um, the third one being an increased dependency on research tools, uh, an increased dependency on digital technology, which has resulted in something akin to digital fatigue and a turn on art part towards uh, a returning to the analog, the obsolescent, the manual craft, basically. And, and, and Jali just herself mentioned the, the notion of the pathos of craft, which I think is a very interesting um, concept to um, uh, work with. You know, the, the, uh, the quite phenomenal, I wouldn't say return, but increase of, of textiles and ceramics and, and Kodak slide carousels and super eight millimeter film in in, in contemporary art production, which something that you know 20 years ago was was quite difficult to um, imagine. You know, also the increased uh, interest in object culture and you know questions of thingness, handiwork, labor, manual labor, you know, materiality, physicality. Um, a lot of which also has to be seen, of course, in the context of the of of the marketability of the products that that uh, that this you know. Um, this uh, return entailed. Um, and then fourthly, and here's why I, why, why I'll, um, where I'll try to wrap up, and I'm really rushing things now, so I hope I can get, uh, get to say some more things on my <clears throat> in the panel here. Um, fourthly, of course, there's just the, the, the plain issue of escapism and the fact that the, you know, that the present um, and certainly the future may not be such an interesting place to be as an artist um, or a cultural producer or a reader or you know whoever and and the appeal obviously of a past that uh, that can appear um, slightly more Edenic. Um, just yesterday on the way in I happened to watch Midnight in Paris on the plane which is the plane being the only place where I ever get to see movies so this is Woody Allen and I'm now I, I wrote this down in fact you know so that's how well I, pre I, I did prepare myself <laughs> Um, Owen Wilson, I don't know if you've seen the movie, it's quite entertaining and also quite relevant for today's um, debate, but at some point Owen Wilson is, um, well I noted what he said, the present is so unsatisfying. Um, and, and for me, in, uh, Tim in his introduction kind of you know, tried to periodize the, the phenomenon of this historiographic turn in art and he turned to the archival impulse, which is a book uh, which is an essay published in 2002. And for me, in many ways, the historiographic turn in art, or you know, like this, this, uh, the, this turning towards history and towards the archive and towards um, the past and the cultivation of this retrospective glance, seen from afar, I think, is very much the def a defining aspect of art of the Bush years, um, which I think, and um, you know, just you produced a rather bleak uh, world, you know, uh, a, a world in which many people did not feel terribly at home. And I think that this has produced a strong incentive in people like the Citadine, for instance, to look at, um, at you know, earlier eras and earlier um, phases of, 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 of cultural production. Um, anyway, this, that was 2012, or almost 10 years later. And um, I'd like to conclude with a quote from the same Friedrich Nietzsche book that I read from earlier, um, because the question, of course, is what now? You know, 2012 will be the, the first anniversary of the archival impulse, or the first decade uh, anniversary of the archival impulse. Um, so the question, what now, could perhaps be answered in the following quote by Nietzsche. What is the use? To the modern man of this monumental contemplation of the past, this preoccupation with the rare and classic. His answer to the question, <clears throat> it is the knowledge that the great thing existed and was therefore possible and so may be possible again. Um, and my call, very you know, pathetic though it may sound, um, is that you know, it's kind of worth working towards, towards this, you know, this making things possible. And I think that art in that regard is always the greatest of contributions. Thanks. We're going to take a, a very brief break and then we'll uh, continue with our panel. Thank you.